All right, good to see everybody again this morning. Welcome to those of you joining us online. You know, as I was preparing for this um, sermon, I just felt like there's a lot of craziness going on in the world right now, isn't there? I mean, there's always craziness, but it just seemed like this weekend in particular. I went to bed Friday night, and I'm, I didn't realize my phone had this public service announcement. I'm, I'm, st- I'm woken at like 11.30 at, at night after I'm already asleep to this, um, you know, evacuate. You got to go to East Palestine High School because, you know, there's been, I don't know, so some of you got this too. Yeah, that was crazy, pretty unsettling. I have no idea where um, James Street Crossing is, so I'm feverishly looking for this, and I can't find it anywhere. Um, anyway, so I looked out my window, none of my neighbors seemed to be alarmed, so I went right back to sleep. Um, but craziness, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. And then there's this Chinese balloon floating over our country. And I trust none of you, none of the four milers were people mooning that thing. Um, I understand that was a big thing to send a uh, message to the Chinese. Um, And then, of course, we have this um, Groundhog Day. And uh, everyone's all fired up about this Groundhog and his prediction about six more weeks of winter. But you know that he's only right 39% of the time. So you actually want him to predict this. Um, But anyway, it's just craziness, isn't it? So um, that's why it's so important that we are focused on what it is that we believe. Because as all this chaos is around us, we have to know what it is that we believe so we can behave. And that's why Paul is teaching us so carefully about belief and behavior. Those first three chapters in this letter that he writes to the church in Ephesus, they're all about belief. And as we are wading into the behavior portion, we keep reaching back to belief because what we believe shapes our behavior. In fact, if you want to really know what you believe, just check out your behavior. Your behavior actually tells you an awful lot. And that is why Paul is urging the church in Ephesus to focus and to respond in step with their beliefs, everything you see up there in blue. Because when they do, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit, they will become the church that God called them to be. Now, in particular, Paul identified some specific behaviors in orange that you see up there that the church is supposed to display. And those are a result of this core belief we learned back in chapters one through three, that God's master plan set in place before the foundation of time is to unite all things in Christ. And he does that through his church. He unites them all as one body. And so as we've learned, those five behaviors you see up there, they're necessary for unity. And that's why he calls them to us. And of course, they build on each other. That, that bottom one there, humility, it's that foundational layer that we need for those gifts of the Spirit to be poured into our lives, right? So that we can start to see gentleness, and then from gentleness, patience, and then from patience, bearing with one another in love, so that we ultimately climax in this maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So that's God's cosmic plan. And the cool thing is, as a church, we all get to be a part of it. So unity must characterize us as a church. So as Cammie read for us, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, Paul repeats this word one seven times, and he's demonstrating the extent to which the church must be unified. Not only that, the order that Paul uses is very deliberate and intentional because it shows us how our unity is a result of the work of the Trinity. Last week, we looked at God the Holy Spirit's unifying role in the church with one body, one spirit, and one hope. We learned that there's only one way to become part of the body of Christ, the invisible church, and that happens when the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us, sealing our identity in Christ, where he convicts, he counsels, he comforts us. We learned all about that. That's that sanctification process, making us more Christ-like each day, always pointing us to our hope in Jesus, to our King, as heirs to his inheritance. So the Holy Spirit's unifying work is absolutely vital for us. He's the one who empowers us to respond to our call to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So today we're going to tackle the second grouping, God the Son, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So there's one Lord, 
And that clearly refers to Jesus. First and foremost, Jesus is unique in his person. There is only one Lord, and he is the Son of God. If you think about what we actually celebrate at Christmas each year, and I'm not talking about the trees and the lights and the mangers or any of that stuff, but the actual incarnation that God became fully man in the person of Jesus. It's really quite staggering if you take some time to think about it, that Jesus is fully God and fully man at the same time. And in his person, this is really important, he embodies all of what we mean when we say this word, Christianity. It is actually a person. It's not a collection of ideas. It's not a bunch of teachings or philosophies or even ethic that we might aspire to. It's a person. It's Jesus, and he's our Lord. And it's so critical that we grasp this truth, because if we don't, we're going to be prone, as we carry out the business of the church, to forget about the person of Jesus. Instead, our focus will become on the Bible. We place an outsized focus on the Bible, or sermons, or prayers, or even praise songs, fellowship, baptism, communion. They're all important for sure, but they are just the means through which we relate to the person of Jesus. So we must always guard against allowing them to become the ends in and of themselves, taking the place of our Lord Jesus. They're there for us to relate to him. Second, Jesus is unique in his work. He is the Savior. That's what he does. He saves, and he's the only one who can. Because God is holy, he simply can't be in the presence of sin. And that's why sin separates us from God. But because God is also merciful in fulfillment of his promises, he sent his son to suffer and die on the cross so that by his blood, that red drop you see up there that was shed for us, God might save his adopted children. And that's the gospel message. But the work of Jesus on the cross is also essential for the unity of the church because it's the only way to salvation. So it's kind of like a rally point of sorts as Christians. It's what we unite around. Now we may have different beliefs about the songs that we sing, the sermons that we hear, the way we fellowship, how we do baptism, or how we do communion, all that church stuff. But we must be absolutely united about Christ's work on the cross because it's the only way to salvation. So it doesn't matter what denomination affiliation you might have. It doesn't matter if you're Lutheran or Baptist or Methodist, Presbyterian or Catholic. It only matters that you've placed your faith in Jesus, that you've been washed white as snow by Christ's blood. You see, all members of the invisible church, regardless of their denomination, have been saved by Jesus. But we can only approach the Father by virtue of the work of Jesus, his son. There's no other way. And that's his unifying principle here. And that's why third, our Lord is unique in his relationship with his people. When sin got us kicked down of the garden, we're separated from God, no longer in communion with him. But Jesus came to bring us back into a relationship with him. And he does that by essentially purchasing us with his blood. And that's a unique kind of relationship when you're purchased. And it means he is now our master, and we are his servants. And we learn back before Thanksgiving that this word servant isn't the way we think about it today. It actually means children who attend to their master. And our master is not an abusive one. He's actually a loving one, and he cares deeply and profoundly for his children. But that's not all. Our relationship with Jesus is also what unites us to other members of the invisible church because our relationship with Jesus naturally brings us into relationship with others who also know him well. Perhaps think of it this way. When Jesus is our best friend, when we're yoked to him, using that illustration Cami gave us a couple weeks ago, nothing else matters. All that divides us goes away because all we care about is living for him and for his glory. Moreover, when we're yoked to him, we move at his pace 
and in his direction, not ours, which brings us in step with others who are also yoked to him. And so we not only respond to his love by loving him back, but we also respond to his love by loving each other. So the question I have for you this morning, do you have that kind of intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior? Would you describe it as being yoked to him? Have you done what we talked about last week? Have you gotten over yourself so that you can respond to your calling and play your best for him, denying yourself, taking up your cross, following after him with all your gut? Have we done that this last week? Have we loved him? Have we loved others? Or did we leave here last week and just go back to our ordinary life? Because again, as we're learning, our behavior tells us what we actually really believe. So there is one Lord, and then there's one faith. Now, Paul's already taught us about faith back in chapter 2. So I just want to quickly refresh us on this. Our condition before we met Jesus is that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're completely separated from God. But because of the person and work of Jesus on that cross, by God's grace, we've been saved. Recall, grace is unmerited favor, meaning we've done absolutely nothing to deserve it. It is a gift from God. Not our actions, our efforts, what we know, any seeking that we may have, or even our repentance that does it. It's all from God. God's grace is the only source of salvation. And salvation only happens by virtue of that drop of blood up there. Nothing less and not a single thing more. Jesus' blood is completely sufficient for our salvation. And the mechanism through which it all unfolds is faith. And faith is represented by that bridge you see up there. So to be clear, we are not saved by faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is the mechanism. We learned that back in the fall. And that is the one faith that Paul is referring to. He's not referring to our individual perspectives on God that are often shaped by the experiences we have or by our upbringing. He's also not talking about the theology of faith. He's not talking about those confessions, like that song, that first song we sang this morning. It's a confession of our faith. He's not talking about that either. And the reason Paul's not talking about that is because each of those things tend to divide us. He's talking about things that unite us, one faith in Jesus, that mechanism through which we're made alive in Christ. You see, there's only one bridge from death to life, and it operates through that mechanism of one faith, which involves placing our belief in Jesus and in him alone, and then behaving in step with whatever it is that we profess to believe. And of course, that entire graphic you see up there, that is a gift from God. That's grace. It's a picture of that one faith that unifies us. So there's one Lord, one faith, and finally for today, one baptism. So as divisive as songs, sermons, and things all church tend to be, there's perhaps nothing as divisive as baptism. In fact, if you look at all the different denominations, 31 different denominations of being a Baptist and all those different things out there, they're all a result of people not being able to agree on things like baptism. And that runs completely counter to the very purpose of baptism, which is to unite us in Christ. So let's make sure that we are very clear here what we mean when Paul says this reference to one baptism. And we'll start by hitting what the phrase one baptism does not refer to. Paul is not talking about becoming a Christian because you were exposed to water in a ceremony. The physical act of engaging with water does not have any saving properties whatsoever. And there are certainly denominations that describe that water as magical and somehow that magic does something to you, but that is not in the Bible and that is a divisive position that people take. Similarly, Paul is not teaching that we must all view baptism as a rite of passage, that if we simply just do this, this, this ceremony, that we are actually initiated somehow into the faith. Because as far as we know, the thief on the cross, he wasn't baptized, and yet he is among the faithful in Christ Jesus by Christ's own words. Similarly, 
Paul is not suggesting there's only one method of baptism. And this is the area where churches love to divide over. Infant versus adult baptism. Sprinkling versus dipping versus immersion. Is it okay to perform it in a baptismal, or do you actually have to go to a stream? Should we use salt water or fresh water, hot water, cold water? Are you kidding me? This is what people argue over about baptism. It has nothing to do with that. Because if you look at the tradition of the church, in the early church, we see sprinkling, dipping, immersion. We see this happening across all ages of the early church. They didn't seem to care a whole lot about the method. They were focused on the substance of baptism. So Paul is also not referring to the method when he says one baptism. So what is he referring to? Well, what one baptism does refer to is being born again. It's what baptism represents. So let's make sure we're really clear what we mean here when we say born again. It's very simple. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and calls us to humbly bend the knee before the cross, and place our faith in Jesus, we're made right before God by Christ's blood. That's what it means to be born again. It's what it means to be born into a new life in Christ, sealed by the indwelling Holy Spirit. That is what one baptism refers to. It's also what unites us as members of the invisible church. Perhaps think about it another way. Because again, this born again is really important that we understand this. So imagine that you've screwed up royally. You've broken the law. You're busted, you're arrested, and you've been charged. And you now stand before the judge. The judge hears your case, he listens to the truth of your circumstances, and he renders the verdict, guilty as charged. Your life as you know it, it's over, seems to be at least. Shame, humiliation, imprisoned by your transgression until death. But then something remarkable happens at sentencing. The judge calls his innocent son in, and he basically gives your sentence to his son, and all that goes with it, including your shame, your humiliation, and your sin. Now notice, the judge doesn't let the offense off the hook. He doesn't just excuse it, and that's because he's a just judge. No, the penalty of the sin must be paid for, but you don't pay it. His innocent son does. But even better, not only does his son pay the penalty, but the judge then declares you completely innocent with the right standing before him because he takes the innocence and the righteousness of his son and he imputes it to you. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, essentially, that Christ's position as God's son has been given to you. It makes you an adopted child of God with full rights as heirs to his kingdom. You're not only free, but you have a new identity. You are a child of God. Or to use Paul's language from chapter 1, you're a servant of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Your identity is now in Christ. So baptism, being born again, is dying to the old self and being born again into a new life in Christ, becoming a child of God. That's what born again means. So one baptism speaks to our identity in Christ, and our identity in Christ is what gives us clear and definitive answers to those three existential questions that we've been mauling over since May when we kicked off this study. We now know where we came from. We're chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That's where we came from. We know where we're going when we die, to be in the fullness of his glory for all eternity. That's where we're going when we die. And we know why we're here, to glorify God and enjoy him now and forever. That's our identity, unified in Christ, because we belong to one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. 